Thank you, Brother Connor. Thank you for a lovely welcome. Um, I have been in this house since eight years before, uh, visiting a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine, Father Fancy Moran. And I also knew Father Joseph, of course, um, of, of fond, fond memories. The, something will have to be done about Ireland. The clergy are in disarray. The religious are fighting. The clergy are drinking. There are scandals in the church. And this was the refrain, the common refrain in Rome and elsewhere in the 1660s. And I suppose the story begins in St. Oliver in Loch Crew, um, Old Castle, just outside Old Castle, about three, three kilometres outside Old Castle. And here we have a scene of um, Loch Crew House and Church. Um, where St. Oliver was born and bred, uh, I suppose, for the first few years of his life. Uh, the second scene, so we have the tower house here. So St. Oliver would have lived here, and uh, probably born in the tower house and lived there. And then the chapel then was, was attached to it. Um, the Plunkett family were a well-known Anglo-Irish family in Ireland. Um, although it might, be more, it might be true to say that they were pre-Norman, um, because we know that a John Plunkett was, um, there's a re reference to a John Plunkett uh, at Bewley in Drogheda, just outside Drogheda, in 1082, which would be almost 100 years before the arrival of the Normans. So they may well have been a normal Norman clan uh, who came to Ireland before the Normans. Um, they were, um, I suppose, the clan. Um, the larger and more important parts of the family, I suppose, relations were at Dunsany, at Killeen, and the Earls of Loud at Loud Hall. St. Oliver, um, his father was the Earl, if you like, um, of, of Loch Crewe, the Baron of Loch Crewe, some called him the Lord of Loch Crewe, uh, but more, I suppose, more correctly, the Baron of Loch Crewe. They were a small, um, I suppose, a small uh, family um, of, of the Plunkets. Sorry. Uh, um, he was born in 1625, although the, a lot of history books would tell us that he was born in 1629. And that uh, came about um, from the biography of uh, Cardinal Morn, who surmised his date, date of birth, because it, they reckoned that he went to Romans in 1645, and they knew that St. Oliver had, had uh, been educated and spent time with um, a second cousin of his, uh, Patrick Plunkett, Father Patrick Plunkett, and later Bishop Patrick Plunkett, until his 16th year. So Cardinal Moore, in the um, second half of the 19th century, surmised that he was born in 1625. But it since came to light that he actually went to Rome in 1647. And then in the early 1930s, um, the date was unearthed in the Bodleian Library in London. Um, stating that St. Oliver was born in 1629. So he uh, had one brother, Edward, three sisters, Mary, Anne, and Catherine. Um, and as I mentioned, he was um, educated by his uh, second cousin, uh, Patrick Plunkett, Father Patrick Plunkett of Killeen Castle. Um, Killeen Castle at the time was, was a, a quite, an, a, quite a, a castle and an establishment, and we see the the church there, the old ruined church. Um, Patrick Plunkett was titular abbot um, later on. He was, he was uh, titular abbot of um, St. Mary's Abbey, Cistercian Abbey. He was a Cistercian in Dublin. But um, at that time he was living in, in a, as a chaplain, if you like, and uh, involved in the secular clergy in, in County Meath, in Killeen, in Kilcloon, and that area around uh, Dunboyne, etc. Um, they, they were very involved with the, um, I suppose, when he was young, they were, the family were very involved with the Confederation of Kilkenny. Um, Sir Nicholas Plunkett, um, Father Plunkett's, Oliver, uh, Patrick Plunkett's brother, uh, was Sir Nicholas Plunkett. And he uh, later on became president, if you like, of the council, the Confederate council. Uh, and later on we'll hear how he was sent, he went to Rome with Bishop Nicholas French, 
representing the, uh, the Confederate Council at the time. Here we see Don, uh, Don Cannon, uh, and it's on the mouth of, um, just outside Waterford, if you like, on the sea, uh, commands, a, I suppose, a, um, a commanding position there in the River, river Shore. Um, and Don, Oliver would have spent some time in Confederate circles. The Plunkett family were deeply involved in the Confederacy. Uh, Bishop Patrick, um, Father Patrick, became Bishop of Arda, um, and much later he became Bishop of Mead. But um, as titular abbot of St. Mary's Cistercian Abbey in um, Dublin, he was involved in the Confederacy as a member. And then as Bishop of Arda, he was even more involved, if you like. Uh, as Lord Abbot and, and Lord Bishop, they were lords, if you like, present um, and taking an active part in the Confederacy. So Oliver spent a lot of time in, in their company and he would have moved in their circles and in that uh, Confederacy circle. Um, so he was deeply involved in it and much later on at his trial um, in 1681, he said that he had not been in uh, Duncannon, Wexford um, or, or um, Limerick in these past 36 years, which would have dated it back to 1645. Um, and that's just a scene, if you like, of, of John Cannon. So um, also at that time, we had um, Father Peter uh, Francis Scrampy. And Scrampy was the papal uh, representative. Now, he, he wasn't the papal delegate or um, as such. He was, uh, Father Scrampy was replaced by Rinuccini. Uh, who, was, who was the papal delegate. Um, but Scarampi was a representative, if you like. But he was held in high esteem. And um, young Oliver would have known him quite well. Um, and in 1646, it was decided that he would go back to Rome. Uh, and René uh, came from Rome. Um, and it was decided that Oliver, along with a few other young, young men, would accompany him on his journey back to Rome. Uh, to, to um, become priests in the Irish College. Um, Scarampi was a holy man. Um, he was a practical man. He, was a, um, he had been a soldier in, in his younger days, and Oliver learned a lot from him. Um, I suppose the two people who influenced Oliver most uh, in many ways would have been Father Patrick Plunkett and uh, Father Scarampi. They were both, very, both extremely charitable men. Um, and uh, Oliver learned a lot uh, from, from them, looking after the poor, and Oliver followed their, their example uh, throughout the, the rest of his life. Um, it was decided anyway that um, they would go to Rome, but they waited in Waterford for many months um, for a boat, and here's just an example, typical example of a 17th century uh, boat. Um, they waited until um, February of uh, 1647. They waited for several months for, I suppose, a suitable wind and a suitable boat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, while they were, um, Scarampi was held in very high esteem, and there was a parade held uh, on the quays of from Waterford down to the quays um, with bands, and many, many, I'm sure, thousands of people would have taken part in that. So Oliver was waved off, if you like, uh, because he was under the mantle and under the. Uh, guardianship, if you like, of, of uh, Father Scarampi. He was waved off by thousands of people um, at Waterford in, in February 1647. Um, he, while out at sea, of course it was illegal at that time for young men to go to the continent to enter seminaries. And while out at sea, um, they were chased by two privateer um, boats. And these would be, I suppose, pirates basically, but they would be licensed pirates. Um, from the British government at the time. Um, I don't know what the arrangement was or what way the cut would be made, but there was a cut, um, and these were licensed pirates, but they were dangerous men. So they were no sooner out at sea than they were chased by two uh, privateer, um, if you like, boats, um, pirate ships. And um, it, things looked bad. The boats were catching up on them. Uh, Father Scrampy uh, gathered his little group around him. Uh, they prayed and knelt on board a ship, um, and they prayed um, for guidance and for deliverance. And um, he promised that they would um, 
uh, well, he did two things. Um, he promised that he would rename the ship um, St. Francis and that he would go to Assisi, that they would go to Assisi and make a little pilgrimage on their way to Rome if they could escape their pursuers. Uh, lo and behold, a short time after that, a terrible storm blew up for two whole days. And when the storm subsided, um, the pirates were nowhere to be seen. Um, but they, in turn, had been blown way, way off course, and they ended up at um, Ostend. They landed in us, eventually landed in Ostend. Um, walking down, down through the um, Ardennes, um, they were um, abducted, if you like, by uh, robbers and, um, who demanded a ransom. And we don't know what happened at that stage, but obviously a ransom was paid. Obviously they were robbed of all the valuables or all the money. And Oliver would have had money with him because um, I'm sure quite a few people would have um, pledged or, or given him money and uh, the family being so well connected. Um, so they were left penniless anyway, and we don't know the full story about who paid a ransom, perhaps some other group uh, or charitable group or religious order uh, might have um, paid a ransom. Um, but they carried on the way and they, they carried on down through France and eventually made Rome. I'm um, sorry, uh, Assisi uh, and then and into Rome. And um, going into Assisi, it must, they, must have felt, uh, they must have felt it appropriate, I suppose, that um, they were penniless. Um, just like St. Francis uh, would have, would have, would have St. Francis would have approved. Uh, <laughs> um, so they eventually reached Rome in, in May um, 1647. And um, okay, um, the, here was a scene of the old Irish college in, um, in Irish Street. Um, that's the old Irish college on the left. Uh, the Way of the Irish. College of the Irish, um, and he attended, while there, he attended um, um, the Roman College, Collegio Romano, which was a college built by the Jesuits almost 100, 1580s, um, almost 100 years uh, before. Um, and it's, we know that the, the rector um, said that uh, Oliver was one of the foremost students there. Um, he would have walked across from the Irish College, the old Irish College, to the Collegio Romano every day, and he would have walked across the old Roman Forum um, in this area here. And he, of course, it, it, had, it was all, um, it hadn't been excavated at that stage, so nobody, they wouldn't have known what was beneath their, what treasures were beneath their feet at that stage. The entrance um, to the college, um, and some of you may have seen that picture in the old Irish College. Um, and perhaps somebody could refresh my memory um, as, as to, I know the Dominicans are in that uh, building now um, attached to the university. What's the name of that building? Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'm learning something every day. Um, okay. Um, okay. So here's a picture of Cromwell. Um, I suppose while St. Oliver was there in, in uh, Rome, um, things were moving, I suppose, politics was moving at, at, at pace in Ireland. Um, we had the Confederacy. Um, well, there were awful atrocities in Ireland at that time, of course. We had the Battle of Ben Burb, and um, Catholics weren't behind the door in committing atrocities either, particularly in the north of Ireland. So there were some terrible things done at the time. Um, and uh, the rumour had gone around England that up to 12,000, um, I suppose, Protestants had been murdered um, in Ireland. And that was a, a precursor to um, Cromwell uh, coming to Ireland, and he was going to sort things out once and for all. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, um, Sir Nicholas Plunkett and Bishop um, Nicholas French went to Rome um, in 1648, um, and they would have... Um, um, they would have met Oliver, I'm sure, many times well, uh, for the few weeks they were there. Um, and met the Pope. Um, and they hadn't, they were looking, I suppose, um, for a middle ground to, um, I suppose, to, I suppose, to, they're looking for an agreement between the Confederacy, um, the different branches and the different wings of the Confederacy, um, and Ormond and the King, etc. And they were looking for. I suppose the uh, papal, I suppose, uh, approval um, of a middle ground, and, and it, it didn't really come to anything. Um, 
but in 1649, as we know, um, Cromwell um, came to Ireland with a vengeance and uh, he was going to sort us out once and for all. Um, they, during the Cromwellian conquest, um, terrible things happened um, and Oliver um, would have known and would have been, you know, would have got, um, I suppose, communications from Ireland as um, they would have known what was going on. The, the clergy were in hiding. Three of the, three of the bishops were martyred. Um, another one died in prison. Um, quite a few priests were martyred, of course, up and down the country, um, including Dominicans. So we, we, there was a lot of, um, it was a terrible time. Um, but having said that, the Catholics, um, the laity of Ireland, I think it was one of the, um, I suppose in all of history, well, it was the worst time, possibly the worst time in Irish history, but nevertheless, the Catholics of Ireland came through it with, <laughs> um, with honours. Um, they had a choice. They could have given up the faith, but instead of that, they didn't give up the faith. They chose to give up their land, their property, their positions, or, or any spheres of influence that they had. And many of them were, were sent into exile or sent into, uh, went to Connacht, including uh, many of the, the, the Plunkett uh, families. Um, so the Irish people had a choice, um, but they choose to hold on to the ancient faith. Um, and that's to their great credit. Um, here we have a propaganda co uh, college chapel in which St. Oliver um, was ordained a priest um, on the 1st of January, 1654. Um, he, Wiley, um, after his ordination, um, he wrote um, to the director of the college asking to be, I suppose, excused from his solemn promise before he, which he had made and all the students had made before entering the college um, to return to Ireland after ordination. This was in 1654. Priests were still being hunted in Ireland. Um, so he asked that he be excused from that promise, which was naturally agreed to. Um, he was ordained by um, Bishop uh, McGeoghegan, who was uh, from in exile in Rome at the time. He was a uh, bishop of um, Clonmacnoise. Uh, he stayed. Meanwhile, he stayed with the um, he stayed with the Oratorian Fathers, and uh, this is a house um, I've written down here: Carita de uh, San Geralamo de la Carita, um, the house of um, it's where Saint Philip Neri had uh, spent some time about 80 or 90 years earlier. Um, again, a house of charity. Um, Father Scarampi was an oratorian. And again, um, um, the young Father Oliver at the time uh, was, lived here and uh, became a chaplain uh, in, with the oratorian community. Um, he undertook higher studies because he wasn't able to come back to Ireland. He undertook higher studies here in the Sapienza University and he got a doctorate in um, civil and uh, canon law. Um, when he finished his doctorates um, he became, he was attached to the staff of Propaganda College and very soon afterwards became a professor of um, theology and controversies here in Propaganda College and he toiled here for 12 years as professor and it's said that he improved standards in the college a great deal. Um, he had a, a quite pleasant enough uh, lifestyle in Rome. Here we see the vineyards um, and um, he, the Irish College had a vineyard um, out in the hills overlooking Albano, um, 25 kilometres southeast of, of Rome. Um, and he, as a young student in the Irish College, he, he would have spent a fortnight, their summer holidays, uh, was a working holiday, but they look forward to it, uh, it was a working holiday in the vineyard. Um, and that was their summer holidays. Um, later on, while he was in Propaganda College, he um, acquired a small garden vineyard, which was close by the Irish College vineyard. And so I'm sure he spent many happy uh, days there. And I'm sure some of the wine from, um, from some of um, his, his vines would have, would have, he would have used in, in, um, in his holy masses. Um, okay. OK, 
Okay. Um, so things weren't going well in Ireland with the clergy. Um, there were lots of scandals in the 1660s. Um, during the 1640s, I suppose, we had the upheal, upheavals of um, the Confederacy and the wars, uh, the Confederate wars, etc. In the 1650s, we had the Cromwellian conquests. And then in the 1660s, we had the church without any real leadership. We had some secular clergy, a very few religious clergy, an odd one, um, very few bishops. And in fact, there was only one resident bishop in Ireland during all of that time, uh, Bishop Eugene McSweeney from Kilmore, and he was an invalid and obviously in hiding and not active. Um, in the, the mid-1660s, uh, Bishop um, Patrick Plunkett came back um, from France, um, Samur in France, and he um, was Bishop of Meath and was active in the northern uh, province, if you like, but all the time had to watch his P's and Q's uh, and be careful um, uh, not to be too active or not to be seen to be doing too much. Um, there were several scandals, I suppose, in the church in the 1660s. Um, we had the remonstrance, um, and I suppose there's always um, a little bit of modernism, I suppose, etc. Um, there was a, a group of uh, clergy um, led by a Franciscan, Father Peter Walsh. Um, I suppose leading up to that, um, Ormond had um, became the um, viceroy for a second time, and uh, they realised that um, even, even after the Cromwellian conquest and the, the harshness of it, that they hadn't overcome, they hadn't written off the Catholic religion in Ireland. So I suppose guile um, and deceit and lies, etc., became necessary. So um, the Duke of Ormond um, decided that the, next, the, best, the best policy was divide uh, and conquer. And with that, um, there was a remonstrance or a, a pledge of loyalty um, to be made to the king uh, in the hope, um, sorry, not to the king, but just to um, the crown, if you like, not to the crown, but to the government of the day. The, the, um, uh, sorry, to the king, yes, to King Charles had been restored in 1660, um, that there would be a remonstrance or declaration of loyalty. But this was not agreeable to Rome because I suppose it, it affected the, um, the influ any, any influence that the Pope or the papacy might have over temporal powers. Um, I suppose it was, there was a nuance there and um, there was a lot of things written between the lines, but it was totally and absolutely um, rejected by Rome. Um, so Father Peter Walsh and others who were bribed by the Viceroy at the time, um, were very active in this. And they split the, the um, clergy uh, to some degree. Um, they split the laity to, to, again, to a small degree. Um, but they were causing consternation in the church in Ireland. Um, then after that, we had Father James, um, again, another Franciscan, um, Father James Taff in 1668, who arrived in Ireland and, and he said he was vicar apostolic uh, for Ireland, sent by the Pope, and he had papers to prove it. And he showed his papers to Bishop Patrick and uh, others who were in the church, and everything is seen, seen perfectly in order. But at the back of it, he was a remonstrant. And the papers were fake. And he went around the country deposing, excommunicating, sacking, <laughs> getting rid of, um, and he caused consternation in the church. And it was from the actions, uh, from, I suppose, um, from sphere, it was totally, you know, <laughs> over the top, basically. And the, the Irish church just couldn't believe what was going on. For instance, uh, in Armagh, Dias, uh, the vicar general was excommunicated. And most of the clergy in Loud were excommunicated. So there was consternation. Um, and there were letters being sent to Rome. Um, and at that time, um, uh, Father Oliver Plunkett, who was then in Rome, still in Rome, uh, was the agent of the Irish bishops in Rome. And he 
um, helped to, I suppose, to make clear and um, <laughs> um, send letters back to say that this, this guy, Father James Taff, it w was no such thing as Vicar Apostolic for Ireland, that it was a, he was a total he was a liar and a fake, etc. Um, and it took some time for things to, be, to sort themselves out. Um, but one of the good things, I suppose, which happened, um, and this is, it took me a long time to figure this out, and I've asked several people, and I couldn't figure it out for quite a long time. Um, because when St. Oliver came back to Ireland in 1670, there were quite a few chapels in Drogheda, for instance, and most of the towns and cities would have had chapels. And the reason for that was because, again, um, Ormond, um, as viceroy, uh, allowed, while there were no chapels allowed in Ireland um, up to that, Ormond allowed remonstrant priests to open chapels in some of the principal towns and cities in order to bolster them, in order to strengthen them, and in order to, to weaken, if you like, the, the greater majority of the clergy. So by the time St. Oliver came back to Ireland in 1670, the, um, the Remonstrant fraction had been overcome, and uh, priests loyal to Rome um, had taken charge of these chapels um, in, 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 the, in the towns and cities, if you like. Um, okay, so here we have a, a, a scene of, sorry, Pope Clement X, who appointed uh, St. Oliver to Ireland in um, um, 1669. There was a meeting held in Ireland, sorry, in, in, in Rome, uh, to pick a, a new uh, um, archbishop. And um, Pope Clement intervened and said, well, why look any further while we have here in Rome um, a son of Ireland, and you couldn't look for anyone better, basically. So Oliver was ap appointed, and um, uh, but because of the, the times that were in it, it was decided that he, he, his... Um, Episcopal ordination wouldn't take place in Rome, but would take place in um, Ghent on the way back to Rome. Um, we have a scene there of um, the Santo Spirito Hospital where Oliver uh, worked. And before he left Rome, the priest there, uh, one of the chaplains in the hospital, uh, said to Oliver that you're going to shed your blood for, for, for Ireland, for the Catholic faith in Ireland, Father Misko, a Polish priest who was in, in, in the hospital at the time. A scene of uh, St. Bavo's Cathedral in um, Ghent, where his Episcopal ordination took place. Um, Bishop Dal Eugene Dalamon, who performed his consecration. Um, and that's a picture of, um, and these are in Dunsany Castle, a picture of St. Oliver's watch and his ring. And it was customary at the time for the consecrating bishop to present um, a bishop um, with a, a ring. So... Possibly that, one, that ring was given to him by Bishop Dalamont in, Bre in um, Ghent. There's just a little scene um, of, um, a, a, pic of a, a plaque which, which was unveiled in Ghent uh, in 2008 um, to commemorate St. Oliver's uh, Episcopal ordination there. Um, bishop Clifford, um, Auxiliary Bishop of Armagh, uh, Father, uh, now Monsignor James Carroll and Drahada, and Bishop Van Loy, Lucas La Van Loy, the Bishop of Ghent. Um, because, yeah, there, there hadn't been, um, there hadn't been, there, there was no marking, there was no, in fact, they hadn't even known about it in Ghent. And um, we initiated, we decided we'd like to initiate, um, a, a, if you like, a trip to Ghent and to recreate, um, in, one, in some little way, um, St. Oliver's return to Ireland. Um, and so that pilgrimage was set up, and about 20 of us went from, our, from Ireland um, to Ghent in 2008. Um, an interesting thing, that's a relic of the True Cross. Um, St. Oliver, before he left Rome, he asked um, the Vatican for permission to bring with him the Scannerola Cross. And this is a relic of the True Cross, which was in Rome and given to uh, one of his predecessors about, um, by um, Archbishop Scannerola about 50 years or so previously. Um, and there's no further reference to that relic of, um, of, of the True Cross since. And no one knows uh, whatever happened to it. It had been in St Isidore's. Um, maybe Napoleon and his, uh, his troops may have uh, taken it in, in the early 1800s, but um, there's no reference to it uh, since. So no one knows whether St. Oliver took possession of it or not. Um, perhaps he did uh, bring it with him, um, but 
he mustn't have because there's no, no further reference to it. But while we were in, lo and behold, while we were in, in Ghent in 2008, um, Bishop Van Lucas presented us with this relic of the True Cross. So here we are um, recreating, in a sense, in a small way, um, St. Oliver's return to Ireland, and uh, we brought with us, unexpectedly, a relic of the True Cross, which is now in that lovely reliquary um, in St. Peter's Church in Drogheda, on the opposite side um, to the shrine. Um, leaving um, Ghent uh, on his way home to Ireland, he came to uh, via London, and there we have uh, Bishop uh, Philip Howard in, in London. Um, sorry, he was Father Thomas Howard at the time. He became bishop and laid, later the Cardinal of Norfolk, um, a Dominican, of course. Um, and he was in Santa Sabina in Rome, and he took possession of the relic of the head of St. Oliver um, in the, uh, I suppose, the mid 1680s. Uh, here we have a picture of uh, St. James's um, um, Palace in, in, in London, um, where St. Oliver hid um, under the care of, of um, Father Howard in, in the, on his way home uh, to Ireland. Um, a, a scene of our Patrick, um, when, when Oliver came back to Ireland, he set up his headquarters in, Nord, in the north of County Loud. Um, Ard Patrick and Ballybarrack, and these became his two pro-cathedrals, if you like. St. Oliver was um, of Anglo-Irish extraction, uh, loyal to the king. So he set up his headquarters on the borders of the Pale and the Gale, if you like, um, and more or less in the centre, not quite in the centre, but near enough to the centre of the diocese, which was much more convenient for him. And as, he was, as there were only two active bishops in the province at the time, and in fact for some years he was the only active bishop, it was more convenient for him to be able to set off to the, to, uh, across the northern province from here, from Ard Patrick. So he had many um, synods and provincial councils and ordinations were held here in this ruined little chapel in Ard Patrick, which is just outside Loud Village. Uh, and here's the other one, which is just about three kilometres outside uh, Dundalk at Ballybarrack. And that's the scene of the annual commemoration, which is held on the second Sunday of July each year outside Dundalk. Here's uh, some of his vestments, and these are in um, Mullingar um, um, Museum, attached to the cathedral in Mullingar. And uh, it's possible that these also belonged um, to Bishop Patrick, but um, these were given to that museum by um, Lord Fingal, and um, um, the Fingal say that they were St. Oliver's vestments. Um, there's a scene of, um, on the vestments, the, um, the road to Amas, the inn at Amas, um, and another one. Um, and these are planar vestments which are attached, which are in um, the Ophi Library in Armagh. And these possibly were his travelling ones, um, or part of them. Um, here we have, you would have seen this picture before, I'm sure, um, it was the canonisation picture, and it um, is in uh, the shrine at, at Drogheda, but it originally hung from um, St. Peter's Basilica during the canonisation ceremony um, in, in 1975. Um, it's very symbolic. Um, here we have um, St. Peter's Basilica in the background, where St. Oliver spent 22 years of his life, and became Roman, in fact, and in fact, he, 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 um, it became more natural for him. He was more fluent, if you like, in, in, uh, in Italian than he was in either Irish, English, or, or I suppose Latin. Um, here we have a ruined church that he came back to, symbol of the, ruined, the ruins that he came back to. Here we have um, a scene, of, a confirmation scene, um, outdoors, uh, perhaps at a mass rock under a tree, um, because at that time, Besides Drogheda, while there were fine chapels of the Jesuits, the Dominicans, the, um, the Augustinians, um, in Drogheda, um, there weren't any other chapels north of that. The mass rock was in vogue. Uh, because Catholics, when St. Oliver came back to Ireland, and he said that, that there were only three Catholic families with any land in the whole northern province. Um, okay, so here we have a priest being ordained. And we know that St. Oliver well, sorry, in, in 1704, during the registration uh, of priests, um, 30 years later or so, there, were, there are 120 priests 
active in Ireland um, who had been ordained, who said they had been ordained by St. Oliver. So uh, on that grounds, um, St. Oliver must have ordained a couple of hundred priests. Here we have um, people kneeling down, and it's the love and devotion of the Irish people, um, I suppose, over, over the centuries. Uh, we have a man here presenting his son to be educated, and one of the, uh, St. Oliver was very, I suppose he, he was insistent on this because there was a great need for education, of both of laity and, and of priests. So one of the first things he did was he set up the schools in Drogheda. And um, uh, these were founded and uh, built from the ground up and were active um, within, uh, well, they were set up, they opened in July. I mean, he returned uh, in March and was in Ireland for Lent and they were active uh, up and running in July. So he was lucky that on board Planola weren't in existence at the time uh, because it would have taken several years, I'm sure, and there'd be injections and all the rest of it. Um, and he paid for everything with his money that he, he, he brought from Rome, and he said himself that he even paid for the, the frying pan. He brought the Jesuits into the diocese, which is a bold move because the Jesuits were hated at the time. Um, he brought the Jesuits, hated by, um, I suppose, the, the, um, the Anglicans um, and, and uh, the government, and uh, etc. at the time. Um, but he had to defend the, the schools on many occasions. He went to... Um, he was called to the Viceroy in, in Dublin on nine occasions to defend the schools, but he succeeded and he defended them on each, on each occasion. Um, but also at the schools, and I'm sure um, there was method in his madness, madness he, he had a, a college for priests, and this college could accommodate, well, so, uh, he said 25, another letter he said 50, another letter he said up to 56 at a time. Uh, were priests who had good men who had been uh, ordained over the over the previous generation or so, but who who, seri who lacked ser training, I suppose, and were seriously deficient in many ways. So this was an opportunity um, for, um, for education of, of of priests at that time. Um, we have here a broken pike at the bottom of the picture, and Saint Oliver is noted for his his work at peace and reconciliation. One of the serious problems at the time was. Um, the original of the IRA, who were the Rapparees, come uh, stroke Tories, and they were active particularly in Tyrone and Fermanagh at the time. They were dispossessed over the previous couple of generations. They were um, fighting a rearguard action. They were uh, robbing and stealing. Um, many times the parish priest would be um, fined, perhaps, or, or imprisoned, or um, banished from a parish because if these people were active in, a, in an area. Anyone who helped them were fined, uh, families, etc. So there were many hundreds of families who were, were fined and impoverished because of the actions of these people. Uh, so St. Oliver, with, with, uh, along with a priest, went to the hills of, of uh, Fermanagh and Tyrone. Uh, prior to that, he, he met the Viceroy and he, um, he um, I suppose, negotiated um, a, a ceasefire. Um, and he went to them and spoke to them in Irish for, for an hour. Um, he told them about that their, uh, their spiritual and physical lives were in danger. Um, and he persuaded them to give up fighting and to, to lay down their arms. Um, and the government, um, for their part, um, released the prisoners, all, all the prisoners, including uh, two prisoners who were due to be executed in, in a skillet. And this was quite a coup at the time. And it mirrors, in many respects, it mirrors the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, when we had the laying down of arms and the release of prisoners. Um, so St. Oliver then be, has become since, if you like, a patron for the Northern Ireland uh, peace process. We have a scene then, the gallows scene, of course, and um, we'll speak about that we'll just in a little while. Um, St. Oliver is noticed for his letters, and uh, Monsignor John Handley has, has uh, written the definitive book on St. Oliver and the letters. Um, there are about 230 letters of his uh, which are extant, um, and many of them are over a thousand words in length. Um, uh, quite detailed, but um, there are reports, generally speaking, there are reports to Rome, and they don't, his personality doesn't come across 
uh, that often, but it does come across because there are so many of them and because there, um, I suppose there's so much material there, um, that uh, nevertheless his personality does come across. So he's a man of wit, um, an educated man, um, very compassionate, um, very sincere, very honest, and he says that uh, if anyone ever finds that I've told a lie at any stage, um, let the whole world come crashing down on me. Um, he, there are many phrases which he uses uh, you know, um, on occasions, such as um, when, um, let me say, he used this, the sailing metaphor quite a lot. I suppose he had been stuck at ports waiting for favourable winds on numerous occasions, um, at least four occasions. Um, and uh, so he, he says that um, when, when, um, when things are favourable, we should hoist the sails. Um, and, and I suppose he did that. So for three or four years after he returned from 1670 until the end of 1673, he basically had a free hand. Um, and he set, he, he uh, I suppose, um, he, he travelled the country. He brought peace to the diocese, he brought peace um, uh, to the church. Uh, he settled the great dispute between the Dominicans and the Franciscans over questing rights. And because the orders hadn't been active in the, or allowed, I suppose, for, uh, they hadn't been active and, and present in some of the dioceses. Um, the Franciscans in particular strongly objected to the Dominicans coming back on the scene. And there were three abbeys in particular. There was one at Gola in Dromore Diocese, Newtonards and Carlingford. And then there was also a dispute about uh, Dromore. So there were four dioceses then that the, the Franciscans were trying to exclude the Dominicans from. Um, and uh, Oliver offered to mediate. Um, he offered um, his services to Rome, which was accepted. And he, he investigated and um, he went, he, he held in particular an investigation that he went to Carlingford and spoke to, he said, you know, so there was depositions made by the Franciscans and by the Dominicans. And, but the Franciscans had negative argu arguments, as, if you like, all, all the way. Well, the, Francis well, the Dominicans could say, well, th th these abbeys had been theirs, they had been there, they were now back. The Franciscans were, say, were saying, well, even if the Dominicans were there originally, we are here now, and so there's no need for the Dominicans to come now, and etc., etc. But um, Oliver um, came, on, came down on the side of the Dominicans, um, and um, as he said himself, I know, he said, by doing this, all hell is going to break loose, and it did. And um, it was as a result of that, by and large, that... Um, you know, some of the Franciscans in particular um, plotted on the remonstrance, etc., plotted against him. And uh, I suppose if, if um, that dispute, uh, which lingered on um, for some time, um, and that was really probably the, the cause of his, of his martyrdom um, in 1681. Um, so that's a, one of his letters. Um, and another one, a signature there at the bottom. Um, the letters were, I suppose, a big part of his apostle. He felt that he, he would, should be reporting everything to Rome. He felt that he was the under physician, uh, physician sorry, uh, reporting to the, to the master physician in Rome. And that uh, he, he felt that he should report everything. And he was humble in that, even though he knew by reporting everything to um, the internuncio in Brussels, and then he was reporting, he said everything, sending all his letters to Rome, that he was getting more and more instructions to do this and do that, and some things he would be allowed to do, and other things he would not be allowed to do. Um, and, but he was happy to do that, he was very obedient. And he would, uh, I suppose that was one of um, his traits, that he was, um, even, I suppose, if he sensed what Rome, even though he might have felt that he might need to do something differently, but if he sensed that Rome would um, say X, Y, or Z, well, he would go along with that. Um, here we have, um, well, that's Carlingford Abbey, a Dominican, the ruined abbey in, um, in, in Carlingford, one of the disputed abbeys. Um, Bishop Peter Talbot, Archbishop Peter Talbot of, of Dublin. Uh, this was another great problem um, that, that he had and the church had. Um, as soon as he came back, within two months, he, he, um, he called a synod in Dublin. Um, 
There were a couple of bishops in Ireland at that time, and most of the provinces had two bishops, maybe an archbishop and another bishop. Um, so we called a, a, a synod in Dublin, and at that synod, um, Archbishop Peter um, Talbot, um, of the Talbots, um, shocked those present when he said that um, he should um, chair the meeting, that he should sign the meeting's proclamation, um, and um, for several reasons, um, well, principally, if you like, because he had, he had been given um, a sanction by the king to control the, and take charge of the clergy in Ireland. And um, um, St. Oliver and the others present were shocked at this because um, this could, I suppose, there was a certain amount of Jansenism and a certain amount, there was a problem throughout Europe, particularly in France, where um, I suppose the king um, and um, the rulers, if you like, the kings, if you like, had uh, too much control over the, of the appointment of bishops and over um, who, who should do what, etc. So um, St. Oliver um, was appointed primate of Ireland and his bull of appointment uh, said such, uh, and whereas Archbishop uh, Talbot's uh, bull, if you like, of Dublin did not state that. Um, so, but having said that, uh, St. Oliver, uh, Saint, sorry, I suppose Dublin had been growing in importance um, over the centuries. It was a big archdiocese. Lots of things were happening. Um, and Archbishop Talbot uh, felt, no doubt, that um, if the king had given him jurisdiction over the Irish clergy, well, then he could um, take charge and, if you like, um, I suppose, um, placate um, and do things as a result of that that maybe Oliver or others mightn't be able to do. Um, so this, but Oliver... Uh, also, I suppose, his obedience came into play here, and he felt that uh, uh, Archbishop Talbot should be obedient to him as well as primate, um, and it became a bitter row, um, and such that within two years, you know, uh, families, prominent Catholic families in Ireland, were taking sides, um, and it, be, it was getting to a scandalous uh, state. Um, 1673, St. Oliver uh, wrote uh, a little book, uh, this one here, Just Primitale, um, and um, Bishop uh, Talbot wrote a reply. Um, uh, Bishop Maloney, a newly arrived in Killaloo Diocese, uh, reconciled the two of them, um, and I think the reconciliation seems to have been that the, the dispute would um, be sent to Rome. But Archbishop Talbot was, it wasn't that popular, well, was very unpopular with, with the Anglicans in Ireland and with um, the Viceroy because um, his brother was agent of the Irish, um, I suppose, landowners uh, and dispossessed in London, uh, Colonel Richard Talbot. And uh, Archbishop Peter Talbot had spent some time in the company of um, the king while, um, while he was in exile, if you like, during the 1650s in France and in Belgium and different places. Um, and he was prone to politics, whereas St. Oliver, when he came back, he always insisted that the church would not, and that he would never get involved in politics in, in any way. And he was insistent on that, and he was insistent that um, any of the church leaders should not get involved in politics in, to, 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 in any, any way. Um, just a, a mass rock, that one is in Carnale in South Armagh. Um, that's uh, Pope Innocent XI. Um, and in 1676, he became Pope. And um, Oliver knew him quite well. And he wrote, fond he wrote fondly of him that he'd often uh, worked with his uh, Pope, um, Pope's brother um, while they tended um, the, the poor and wretched um, and um, of, of Rome. Um, so even though Oliver was a professor in Rome, he was still uh, doing a lot of charitable work in the Santo Spirito Hospital and in the home um, run by this Pope's uh, brother. Um, that's, uh, he's now Blessed uh, Innocent the Eleventh, Blessed Innocent. Um, King Charles II on his throne. Um, 
1672, we had a declaration um, of um, loyalty, if you like, or sorry, a declaration of indulgence for Catholics. Um, King, um, King thought that he would like to, um, as the, suffer the Catholics had suffered enough. Um, they hadn't subjugated them. They hadn't eliminated the Catholics. So what was the point of, of uh, them being persecuted? But they, um, I suppose they, the um, Parliament, the English Parliament, uh, went mad at that, and uh, they became incensed. And uh, it, it um, because there was an ongoing battle between the Parliament in England, uh, the rump, if you like, of uh, the, of, of the Puritans and uh, and the King. Um, a snow scene here, um, and Saint Oliver. Um, on the feast of the chair of, of um, St. Peter, and that's a picture of the chair of St. St. Peter, um, and St. Peter, sorry, St. Oliver would have been um, at the installation of that chair um, in the apse of St. Peter's um, in 1666, the, the, um, in Bernini's uh, design, lovely design, um, in 1666, and eight years later, on the same feast in, um, in 1674, Oliver was on the run in South Armagh. He was told that agents were on the lookout for him. There was a price of five uh, pounds on the, on the head of priests or bishops. Um, he was on the run and he suffered greatly during that snowstorm in South Armagh. Um, Bishop John Brennan from Waterford, his old friend from Rome, um, was now with him hiding in uh, South Armagh. And um, during that snowstorm, they were almost suffocated in snowdrifts. John Brennan uh, lost, the, lost the, his, the movement of, of his arm for some time um, as a result, and um, prob probably snowbite. Um, and Oliver himself, his eyes, uh, he suffered greatly with his eyes thereafter, and he said that his eyes were constantly watering, that he was unable to read letters as big as headlines, and that he um, but that it didn't stop him and wouldn't stop him from uh, preaching the gospel in both Irish and English. Um, he, um, during that famine, then in, during a famine in 1674, um, over 500 people died in the Diocese of Armagh alone. And he pawned his, um, his candlesticks, which he had brought from Rome, in order to give bread to the poor to the value of one pound per week. And he said that uh, uh, the Catholics were coming to the house where he was and stating, to whom shall we go if not to our primate? Um, this is this uh, tree at Ardpatrick, in, and this tree was left standing in the middle of, of uh, I suppose, a glade of, of, um, of oak trees in Ardpatrick. And it's a tree in which St. Oliver hid uh, while um, soldiers were after him. Um, and it's still there. Um, it's about 20 over, well, it's about eight metres um, in circumference. Um, and I think it has regrown itself, if you like, because it's well over 330 years old, much older than that. And I think it possibly has re-sprouted, looking at it, it has re-sprouted. So that's the same tree that St. Oliver hid in 1674 in, in um, Ardpatrick, just outside Loud Village. Um, in... 1679, he came to Dublin uh, to visit his old um, uh, um, tutor of old, uh, Bishop Patrick Plunkett, and he was arrested uh, near the law, Knoll in, Dub in Dublin. Um, authorities became aware that he was living um, near the Knoll uh, in, in the house of a Mr. Milady. Um, he was brought to Dublin Castle, incarcerated in, in strict um, solitary confinement. Um, he was brought to Dundalk Jail um, the following July, um, and all told he spent 19 months in jail. Um, he was accused of bringing, of organising and plotting to bring a French army into Ireland. And here we have in, in, in Carlingford Lock, and that's the harbour at Carlingford, which was totally ridiculous, of course. Um, the following November, he was tra uh, transferred to London. And here we have a scene of uh, Newgate Prison in London again in solitary confinement, and he was held there in solitary until May uh, the 8th of the following year. Um, that's the, uh, the door of the cell, the con condemned cell of Newgate Prison, which is now in St Peter's Church in Drogheda, a very substantial open door. Um, a scene of his, of his trial, 
in Westminster Hall. Um, and that's actually a scene of uh, the trial of uh, Lord Stafford uh, sometime earlier, a generation or so earlier. Um, this is a letter of petition, um, the king. Uh, the trial originally, um, I suppose, was set for the 8th of um, May. And um, he was in strict solitary confinement until that stage. And then, um, at that trial, it was only then that he knew what the charges were, uh, what he was up against. Um, so he, um, his, um, a, a relation of his, uh, John Plunkett, and a, his servant, James McKenna, uh, um, were then sent from England, from London, uh, to Ireland to, to um, I suppose, to, well, to get witnesses for him on, on his behalf. Um, but they did, weren't allowed enough time, obviously, because they were delayed at uh, Hollyhead. With the, with the, with, they were delayed. They were actually a fortnight in Holly, Hollyhead, waiting for a boat and waiting for a favourable wind. Then when they came to Ireland, the Viceroy um, held them up and um, they weren't able to get records, etc., which they required. Um, so by the time they arrived back in, in England, it was all over. Um, so Oliver's trial took place um, on the 15th of June. Um, the jury retired and after a 15 minute um, adjournment, they came back with a, um, a guilty verdict and St. Oliver's reply uh, and it was Deo gratias. Um, and he was then um, given some freedom of the prison, if you like, as a condemned prisoner. Um, and for the next fortnight of his life, uh, he had many visitors and uh, it's believed that uh, while he was passing through London on his way to Ireland and for the last fortnight of his life, um, England uh, wouldn't have had any bishops. Um, London didn't have a bishop for a hundred years. Um, I think there hadn't been a resident bishop in, our, in England for almost 40 years. And it's said that one of the reasons why the Catholic faith, um, I suppose, uh, fell apart in England um, was because there hadn't been any proper leadership for many generations. Whereas at least in Ireland, bishops were coming and going, um, okay, not there all the time, but there most of the time, there was a certain amount of, of, um, of leadership. And well, that didn't happen in, in England. So um, for the first week of his, uh, sorry, of a, of his, a couple of weeks of, um, I suppose, um, as he was bishop, and for the last few weeks, um, the last two weeks, he probably performed confirmation ceremonies in England because we know that he had many, many visitors at Newgate, at Newgate Prison. Um, that's his petition to the king, uh, which was rejected. Um, Lord Essex, a previous uh, Viceroy of Ireland, also went to the king stating that Oliver was patently innocent and the king retorted, and snapped back at him, well, why didn't you come to the trial or go to the trial and state these things? It might have good, so good some, done good, some good then. I'm not in a position to do anything um, because it will cause more trouble uh, for me, basically. Um, so that's the, the, his letter of petition to the king. Um, this is his um, picture, lovely picture, uh, by William Fry, which is at the, at the shrine in Drahada, being... Uh, dragged, uh, as would have happened, uh, dragged on a hurdle to Tyburn. A scene at Tyburn, uh, another one, it's a stained glass window. This is um, the convent at Tyburn, a miniature altar that they have in the, in the uh, basement of um, a little shrine that they have to the martyrs, an altar of the martyrs at, at Tyburn in London. Um, the trial got a lot of publicity. There were booklets uh, and the transcript of the trial was published pretty widely um, at, at the time. Um, a picture, a, a plaque outside the, um, the, the convent at Tyburn. Um, there were 105 Catholic martyrs and it's significant that um, Oliver Plunkett was the last of the, of the Catholic martyrs of Tyburn and the last of the, I suppose, um, official martyrs, if you like. Um, of, of those who were who were convicted uh, uh, by the state uh, of martyrdom to be martyred in these islands. 
Um, and it was a result of, I suppose, that uh, fair-minded Protestants, of which there were quite a few, uh, recognised and believed that uh, Oliver Plunkett was innocent. Um, that's a list of some of the priests who were ordained um, by Oliver Plunkett, the list which was made at that registration in 1704. The, um, the, head, the, sorry, the body was buried in London. The head was brought to... Um, okay, if, can I have another three minutes, four minutes? Am I running over? Okay, we'll wind up. Okay. Um, so the head was brought to Rome um, and given to Archbishop Hugh McMahon. Um, they, it went through um, Lamspringer in Germany, uh, Westerschrein in Germany. Um, Downside Abbey, it was brought back to bodies in, in Downside Abbey, and that's the um, Downside Abbey. That's the, um, an old picture from Siena Convent and the reliquary in Siena. Um, and that's the ebony box in which the head was hidden for uh, 200 years and it said that it was on top of, of a grandfather clock, the Siena convent. So the, the Dominican um, community have, a, have a, a proud, I suppose, and should have, um, you know, they have an, an honoured position uh, with regard to St. Oliver all down through the years. There's an old picture, uh, again, of, this, of the convent at Siena. A uh, picture then, the, the relic was translated in 1921 uh, to the uh, relatively new church at that time of the Memorial Church of St. Peter. And um, to the dismay of the Siena community at the time, um, and they uh, wrote to Rome um, and appealed the decision to uh, translate the, uh, the relic um, to St. Peter's Church. But um, they didn't um, have a leg to stand on, I suppose, because um, Archbishop, uh, sorry, uh, Morris Corker, who, whom uh, a Benedictine priest who had spent time in prison with Father uh, Oliver, uh, sorry, Bishop Oliver, Archbishop Oliver, in, in uh, Newgate Prison, and Oliver had bequeathed his body and all his belongings to uh, Morris Corker and the Benedictines. So um, the um, the Benedictines then, um, the head was given to, um, but the head was given to Archbishop um, Hugh McMahon. Um, and Hugh McMahon um, gave it, when he gave it to the Siena convent, he stated that it was in their care. Um, but that it was stated in his letter that it was still un under the auspices, under the care, or un under the ownership of the Archbishop of Armagh. So it was, but having had the relic and treasured the relic and venerated it and protected the relic for 200 years, they would rightly have felt that it should, be, should have been left with them. But uh, to their dismay, it was uh, translated to St. Peter's in 1921. Um, a bone relic in Old Castle, which was given by the, the um, Benedictines at Downside in, 19, in 1975. The shrine at Drogheda. There's a picture, a nice picture of the head. Some of you may not have seen uh, the head, and that's as it is in Drogheda at the moment. Um, that's the letter of authentication um, of the head and bones, which is written by a surgeon a few months after the martyrdom, uh, John Ridley, and a prominent um, in, uh, London Catholic, Elizabeth Sheldon. The scene of the beatification in 1920 in Rome, again in the apse. Um, of the um, of St Peter's in Rome, um, first procession in Ireland uh, in, or in Drogheda in 1920 after the after he was made blessed in 1920, and that's a, a procession, the first procession again in 1920 in Lamspringer. They've always had a great devotion in Lamspringer to St Oliver, and he's um, a patron of the diocese. Um, this is the lady who was cured, um, an Italian lady, Giovanna Mertiori Igiano and Monsignor John Handley with her. Uh, her husband, um, Sister Cabrini Quigley, a medical missionary who prayed uh, through the intercession of St. Oliver, and, and play, or Oliver is well, the blessed Oliver at the time, placed a, a, a prayer card uh, under, um, under Giovanna's pillow and uh, prayed regularly with the husband during the night, said the prayer to St. Oliver, to um, blessed Oliver, um, and um, Lo and behold, the lady was cured uh, before the next morning. Um, a scene at the, um, the, the canonization in 1975. Happy Irish people. Um, more of the... This Pope uh, John Paul, um, when he came to Drahad and preached his great sermon of peace, the first thing he did was he venerated the head of St. Oliver. 
and then he preached his great pre uh, sermon of peace and reconciliation. Uh, our peace and reconciliation banner, our prayer. Um, and here we have a scene um, of, uh, I'm nearly finished now, of uh, Cardinal Brady breaking a pike. We had a, um, a great big celebration in 2007 and we were giving thanks for um, the Northern Ireland peace process, how, how far it had gone. And an interesting little story about that. Um, we had this pike make, made, you can see it here, the pike, and um, we, uh, we cut it and uh, we had it glued together, but because it was so weak, we actually taped it with, with um, sellotape just to keep it together. So um, Cardinal Brady came and we had about, well, there were Dominicans on the altar that night too. We had, um, um, with a great big celebration, giving thanks for the Northern Ireland Peace Press process. So during the ceremony, um, Cardinal Brady was to break the pipe. So the sellotape was removed at that and very carefully. And uh, he, he took the pipe, but he couldn't break it. <laughs> and then it broke. And it broke and it was like a gun going off. <laughs> and we have it on video, but it was very fun. But we were, we were so afraid that um, it, it wouldn't, and there were only two, and looking at it afterwards, it was amazing. There were just two drops of glue on the, on the timber, and the glue only covered about maybe 10 or 15% of the timber cut. And it was quite delicate because it was quite easy to, you know, but it was there. And eventually it went, so it was, it, was, it was funny, but I think it was symbolic in its own way. And I, I, I have to say that um, every, every, you know, we've often been worried, and I, I suppose we all are, and we pray about the North, and even in recent times we've had, there have been difficulties and riots, etc. But every time, I think, and I have great confidence in the intercession of St. Oliver for the Northern Ireland peace process, every time we've taken a step backwards, we've taken two steps forward. And I think that, that uh, will happen this time as well. Um, that's uh, a picture in the sacristy afterwards. Yes. Okay, so that's, that's it. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I suppose at the time, um, just to finish up with this following paragraph, that um, when saints are canonised, they have a relevance for their time. And uh, just a, a statement that the Irish bishops made in 1975. Um, which they issued a pastoral letter and just a, a short ext extract from that pastoral letter um, in 1975. We thank God for having given him to us to show us an example in these troubled times and to be our patron in heaven. He traveled the country for 10 years, often in disguise and sometimes barely ahead of his pursuers until his capture and imprisonment put an end to his labors. During these 10 years, he had done as much as any man since St. Patrick to strengthen and preserve the faith in Ireland. We ask him today for all the graces we need for ourselves and for our country. We ask that we may be as he was, steadfast, <coughs> courageous and devout, untiring in our work for peace and reconciliation, loyal to the church and firm in our faith, even unto death. St. Oliver Plunkett, pray for us. Amen.